All right. Um, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about myself here, um, and then I'd love to hear who's in the audience here and um, why you're here tonight and what birds you have or are planning to get. Um, so I started with birds when I was seven. My dad got me a dozen chicks for my seventh birthday, and both my teachers are parents, so they said, you're off to 4-H, you're going to learn about chickens and how to take care of these. Um, that uh, was just a really wonderful uh, introduction to livestock and farming for me. Um, had a really wonderful group of mentors, and I've stuck with it since. Um, and now I've moved on to um, breeding and selling my own birds, uh, as well as holding down a, a day job. And I um, travel internationally to judge poultry all across the country and also in Canada. So. Um, and so, do, who, who has chickens here now? Okay, and who's looking to get birds? What about ducks? Yeah, ducks. <laughs> They're birds. <laughs> Do you have any other bird species that people have out here? Geese or turkeys or anything like that? Ducks. Ducks? Okay. I raise pigeons as well. So. Um, so some of the reasons that we might get into birds, um, you know, there's many. Some maybe we just enjoy them. Um, eggs, I think, is you know is a big reason that a lot of people get into birds maybe to just grow a few of your own so you don't have to go to the stores often. Um, and processing your own birds either for your table or for uh, selling to your friends or neighbors or other people in your community. Um, and then this, uh, you know, maybe exhibition. So um, that's really a big market too, particularly as um, people are, are able to have more birds in backyard settings, um, breeding to standard for purebred birds. Um, and this is me judging up in Canada at a show there. So. Um, when you're setting up your area for your birds, you know, having the proper space for those birds is really important to make sure that um, you have both a setting that you can be chore efficient in, uh, but also one that um, provides sufficient space for the birds. So, my general rule of thumb is to try and provide about three square feet uh, per bird in the coop. Um, and then also include some kind of covered confinement area. Um, that's particularly important when we look at larger livestock, uh, as wet as it is here in the Northwest. But with birds, it's also important as well, too. And I kind of budget that at about 10 square feet per bird. Um, in that setting, if you have it outside, uh, you know, putting a footing in there so that you can allow for better drainage. Um, like sand is, a, is an excellent idea with birds. If it's going to be fully covered and confined, you know, you can go with a looser bedding, um, like an organic one, maybe straw or shavings or something like that. And then having access to a bigger run or yard um, is really is really great for the chicken's health. Um, and I like to think about that in terms of about 100 square feet for birds. Um, I'll mention too that we'll have time for questions at the end, but if there's something you want to jump into now, please feel free to ask any time during the presentation. Um, predator proofing our pens, that's, that's kind of an important thing to think about as well. Um, you know, these are birds that we're going to go out and visit every day, um, feed them, collect the eggs, and care for them. And um, that can really ruin your day to have a raccoon in there. Um, so these are some ideas that I see a lot of folks do um, to help predator proof that. Maybe bear, bearing uh, hardware cloth or wire. Um, you might look at elevating your pens um, or putting more firm rock or other structures down there. Um, and then this uh, one coop here has an apron fence. That's kind of a unique idea to print digging maybe from your neighborhood dogs or something like that. Um, this is a picture of one of my setups here. Um, so I have my pens elevated. This works really well for me. Um, I have, they're at about three feet high so I can just reach right in and grab the birds or the eggs. Um, fully confined and I have a nice uh, sand pathway there to keep things clean. 
um, so I'm not worrying about transmitting disease or anything like that. A little bit of a grass filter strip there to help with nutrients, um, and then I have grow out pens underneath, and I have other pens out in the yard that birds can get out and enjoy the, the sun and the bugs in as well. You have what pens underneath? Grow out pens, so I, I breed and raise my own birds as well, so when I have young birds, um, I just have them seasonally underneath there. And I have a sand footing in there as well, so they can root around in there. Um, watering system. So uh, your conservation district will often help you look at um, your management strategy in terms of chore efficiency. Um, so you know you can go with the the gallon water or something like that. That's typically what I do, but um, it's also pretty nice, especially if you have more than a couple birds to go to an automatic watering system. It allows you to take off for vacation and those kind of things. Um, this, the small cup waters, those work pretty well. Um, the, the bell waters there on the bottom also work well, but they can you know, require a little more cleaning and maintenance there. And then the, the nipple water system, that's one that is really becoming more popular. Um, one thing that's really important to note with that, though, is that uh, you really want to think about the height of your chickens and try and plan for that. They work best when the chickens can go directly up to the nipple, otherwise you can get quite a bit of leakage. Um, and so thinking about siting that as well. I've got a question on that drip line, uh, that drip system. Is that pressurized or is that a gravity flow? It's a, typically a gravity flow. A lot of the systems come with like a five gallon bucket, but you can hook it up with whatever you want. Um, pretty minimal flow. You want maybe a one or two percent fall. Um, the automatic systems, one, one drawback with that um, is thinking about insulating it for the winter if we're in this area here, so um, maybe a system that you might use 80% of the time here, but you might have to still haul water a little bit. And can you speak up just a little bit? Sure. Thank you. Um, we'll talk about bedding here. So in your coop setting, there's a number of you know, different choices that you could use for bedding. Um, I would say wood shavings or sawdust is one of the more the common ones, and maybe straw. Um, some people are starting to move towards using those uh, pellets that when they get damp they expand. That can work well, but they can be pretty dusty. Um, you might also look at sand or kitty litter. Some people use that in some settings. Uh, we tend to use that more with pigeons and cage birds. But um, I'm going to recommend shavings or sawdust, that's my number one choice. Um, in this climate, we're, we're thinking about moisture a lot of the time as well, and we want the birds to have a nice dry place. Straw can work well maybe in a, a deeper bedded area, but um, it tends to have a waxy cuticle, which repels water a lot, so you're not getting that absorption. Um, once that cuticle is broken down, then it really holds the water, and it gets pretty soppy pretty quick. So just not as durable as wood shavings. And we'll talk uh, in a little bit here about nutrients. Um, and wood shavings, I think, offer you a little bit better flexibility in terms of managing your nutrients. Um, so it might be a little hard to see here, but um, Chicken manure is a pretty hot manure. Um, we have a number of different livestock there, and if we're looking at our nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, those are our three main nutrients that our crops are gonna uptake. Um, that's what we want to help grow our gardens or our pastures. And really nitrogen is gonna be your, your biggest driver um, in terms of initiating growth in your plants. Um, and chickens are, are pretty hot, that um, it just means that we have really high nutrient levels in proportion to the volume of manure that they're going to produce. Um, and that's something we want to think about composting or breaking down to set those into a more um, organically available state. So chickens in, in this 
first uh, table there are, are the hottest, and then uh, we move down through um, rabbits, sheep, and then horses and dairy cows last. Um, and the other, the table on the bottom there um, came out pretty small, but uh, if we're looking at broilers or something like that that we're going to be growing on a pretty high protein feed, um, pretty quick turnaround, uh, maybe as much as four times the nitrogen um, per volume as uh, a dairy or a beef cow or even a swine. So I want to think about managing that. And Annika touched on um, shellfish in this area. I know that's a really important um, agricultural product for the region. So. Uh, you know, phosphorus pollution is a big one we want to be thinking about. Um, and as backyard poultry owners um, on a small lot, sometimes that can really be a big concern um, with that runoff. Phosphorus tends to be the, the limiting nutrient in water systems, and so um, we want to think about managing poultry manure so that we're uh, minimizing that opportunity for that to leach into the water system. Uh, at your conservation district, we can help you guys design good manure management structures. These are a couple that I built with landowners. Um, we have a uh, open bin design there on the top, and that landowner is going to be using that big, beautiful tarp there to cover it. Um, we really want to think about covering the manure in the winter and the rainy months. Um, nitrogen is highly water soluble, so. Uh, Any time that it rains on that, or if there's standing water there, it's going to leach right into the water, into your groundwater. Um, that can be can cause issues with drinking water. It can cause pollution, um, and it feeds bacteria and other things that help um, deplete oxygen in the water and then kill salmon. So that's another thing that we're thinking about. But uh, it's also you know nitrogen is fertilizer. It's money, so we want to be saving that. Um, to use in our gardens or on our pastures or our crops. Um, this other one here is fully covered, so they won't have to worry about that, um, managing that tarp or anything, which um, can be important if you're in a windy area. I, I like to recommend a, a cement bottom on wherever you're storing your manure. It just gives you a little more flexibility to turn it, manage it, compost it. Um, but you know, Whatcom, you guys do more with gravel. We also have uh, three tarps to cover piles, so that's a current incentive going right now. Um, so after this talk, if you want to talk about your new pile, I have access to tarps. <laughs> and you guys have um, pre-engineered designs for some of these bins? Yeah, we also have pre-engineered designs. There's a company, this is more a large scale like livestock size, but we can I'd like to recommend having multiple manure piles. Um, you know, and it does take up a little bit more space, but for chickens especially, um, we want to let that sit for three to six months at a minimum and, and break down, um, cook through any of that bacteria that might be there and turn into a more readily usable product for your garden. Um, so if you have a multi-bin system or multi-pile system, um, you can fill one up, leave it set, and turn it occasionally, and then fill up your other bin. At, at a bare minimum, if you just have a pile in your yard, putting a tarp on it is really the best thing that you can do for that. Um, and there's another really tiny, unreadable chart there. Um, <laughs> But it's basically looking at your, your moisture content, and uh, when you do cover it, your moisture content is quite a bit lower. Um, that just helps it break down. We do want some moisture in your manure system, but not too much. Um, and it also translates to when you cover it, you have less nitrogen loss. So. Um, so using your poultry manure in your garden, on your pasture, um, my district has a manure spreader that we rent out, so if you want to drive all the way down to Renton, you can get that. They also have one in Lake Stevens at the Snohomish one, and I don't know if you guys have we one. We don't have one yet. We're, 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 we're,
Yeah. <laughs> they're they're not too expensive, so if you have a, a slightly larger property, um, I would recommend investing in that. Uh, it's basically has a conveyor belt and it can flip it out, um, so you can spread it at a small rate over your whole property or wherever you choose to. Um, this table here, what I wanted to highlight with that is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So I mentioned that poultry manure is pretty hot. Um, our ideal for compost or for garden amendments, pasture amendments, is a 30 carbons to one nitrogen. Uh, and if we look at the chickens there, they're about four carbons to one nitrogen to maybe 20 carbon to one nitrogen. So quite a bit lower, that means we have a lot more nitrogen in the system. Um, and I talked a little bit about how flexibility uh, is something that you can get more from wood shavings and, and that. Um, so we have the, the bulking agents on the bottom there. Uh, so wood shavings may be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 500 carbons to one nitrogen. Um, so very cold would take a very long time to break down. Um, and that gives you, you know, when you are mixing those with your, your bedding and your coop, um, just thinking about the, the ratio of those two things together so that you can get um, the product that's gonna break down the fastest, reduce the volume, and uh, be able to get into your garden faster. So which would be the best then in terms of breakdown? So I like wood shavings because they are pretty a pretty cold material, um, and you can you can put a lot more manure to the shavings so you save um, bedding. Whereas like straw on here, um, they have it as an 80 to one, so you know maybe two parts straw to one part manure. Whereas you might be able to get um, quite a bit more length of time there with your shavings. <coughs> I, I noticed that straw, you know, I have a coop with a wood floor inside that's raised up, and it just, it seems to hold moisture. Yeah, but you see. Another thing about straw is that mites can live inside of the shaft of that, so it's just another opportunity for disease and parasites or something like that. Yeah. <coughs> um, and biosecurity, so these are. Again, these are birds that you're going to see every day, you're going to know and love and feed and get eggs from. We want to keep them safe. Um, so, you know, managing who comes onto the property, who comes off. Um, a foot bath is something that's really easy that you can do very quick, just a small Rubbermaid tub with a little bleach and water in it um, before you go out to the pen if you're inviting people over. Of course, washing your hands. Um, it seems like Every year we have a couple of cases of salmonella or listeria or something like that. So, and then just you know checking up on your birds, know the signs for for when they're healthy, when they're not, um, and what to look for there. Uh, I will say in Washington State, um, you know we're we're encouraged to work with our state vet. We don't have a very good relationship with our state vet in terms of backyard poultry people. Um, our state vet is very tailored towards the industrial poultry side, and um, <coughs> there's a, a national program, the National Poultry Improvement Program, NPIP, um, and people are encouraged to um, enroll in that, and that's where the, the vet will come out and do uh, a couple times a year swabs and testings and things for avian flu um, and flu on typhoid. Um, just in my experience, we haven't really seen a benefit from that program, and it's a lot of hassle. Um, and, you know, government folks come on your property all the time, so. They, they are uh, a regulatory and enforcement agency, which is nice about your conservation district. We're not that, it's all voluntary, and we don't report to folks, so. That's another uh, pull for having conservation district people to work with you on your projects there. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned about their methodology and stuff. We did have a couple farms this year that um, in the Lewis County area that uh, were found to have some low path avian flu. Um, and then they didn't really track which birds those were or um, follow through with their testing to confirm whether or not it appeared or went away or anything like that. So 
And so your best defense for your birds is um, just to, to know about where you're moving them and who's coming in and on the property um, and then just watching them for disease. Um, talk a little bit about some of the different breeds. Um, so can anybody help me out uh, naming some of these different breeds? Silky, Silky yep. What about uh, these guys here? Yep, those are leghorns, so those are one of our big egg producers. Um, but this is a white leghorn and a dark brown leghorn. Oops. This guy here. This is a modern game. Um, they're a pretty small chicken with very long legs. Um, <laughs> they're pretty mellow. They're a lot of fun. I raise those as well. Um, this is an Andalusian. It's a Spanish breed. Cup guy. It's an American breed. Um, and a Dominique. This is a Cornish. That's our major meat bird. And a Langshan, this is a South Asian breed, very large, very tall, long leg. Uh, and Sumatras. So, um, the American Poultry Association, we, we break birds down um, a couple of different ways. In the large fowl, we group them into uh, their categories of origin. Um, and then in Bantams, we, we look at different features about them um, in terms of their combs and feathering. Uh, but for, for backyard birds, um, I'll, I'll touch on three classes here. Uh, I really recommend American breeds. They all are uh, yellow skinned birds. They, lay, they all lay brown eggs. And they're sort of a, a hardy, dual purpose, medium sized bird. Um, we've got a couple here. The Silver Lace Wyandotte, Dominique, New Hampshire, and these, this is a flock of Buckeyes there. Um, so all these birds are, you know, they're uh, from America. They've been bred here to tolerate, you know, the conditions, the um, temperate region here. They're really durable. Uh, they lay a, a good number of eggs, um, and they all tend to be dual purpose. So um, if you're hatching your own, or even if you get chicks from the feed store, or you get a couple males, um, they, they turn out to be a, a good dinner. So. Um, some English breeds, those are also good. The English tend to like their birds to be white skinned and white fleshed. And that's a better bird for the dinner table, they think. So um, they tend to be a little heavier and maybe a little less egg production, but still pretty good. Um, we've got Orpingtons here, Australorp, which is a commercial version of an Orpington, and then Sussex. Uh, those are all pretty common breeds there, um, and all lay brown eggs as well. And Mediterranean breeds. These birds tend to be a little smaller, a little lighter weight, um, a little flightier, but they eat a lot less feed and produce a lot more eggs, and um, pretty much across the board produce white eggs. So, uh, one, one key there is looking at the earlobe, um, that's usually a good indicator of the color of egg that a bird is going to lay. If it's white, they'll lay a white egg. If it's uh, red, they'll lay a brown egg. So um, these are some of my dark brown leghorns that I breed. And they're from Italy. Um, Andalusian, which is from southern Spain. Menorca, that's from an island off the coast of Spain. Uh, they're a really massive black bird, very pretty. Uh, and then Sicilian buttercups, uh, which are from the island of Sicily. Um, so we do have a number of organizations locally here uh, that you might look into if you're interested in hanging out with more chicken people or learning about uh, birds and standard bred birds. Um, I am currently the president for the Washington Feather Fanciers. That's your club that serves the whole state. Uh, we host two shows a year, um, one in Monroe in March and one in Chehalis in November. We also have the Pacific Northwest Poultry Association, that's based out of the Vancouver, Portland area. Uh, Pacific Poultry Breeders is a big one up and down the West Coast. 
and then of course 4-H. So if you have kids or no kids, I would recommend uh, talking to them about 4-H. That was um, pretty instrumental in my development and uh, teaches kids about um, responsibility, uh, livestock management, and just really a wonderful organization. So. Um, and then our two overarching bodies are the American Bantam Association and the American Poultry Association. Um, the American Poultry Association is the oldest livestock breed organization in North America, um, and most livestock standards and shows are developed, modeled off of um, poultry standards there. So uh, they're originally um, created to tailor industry needs with backyard needs as well. So um, figuring out what kind of chicken is going to lay the most eggs and why, what, what body type is that, um, and, and still managing for attractiveness. So. Um, I always like to make a pitch for using standard bred birds as opposed to just going to your feed store and picking up a few chicks. Um, if you're going to have birds, they're going to be living there for, for quite a while. I tend to turn through my birds and after two or three years, but if you take good care of them and you, if they're your pets, they can live to be 15 to 20 years old. So when you're looking at them every day, you might as well look at something that's beautiful and productive as well. Um, if you go down to the feed store, you can end up with a Rhode Island Red like that. Uh, if you were to go work with a breeder and get a standard bred bird, you might end up with something a little richer in color, a little more balanced, a little more beautiful and productive. Um, feed store birds tend to put on the fat faster too, so their egg production declines rapidly after their second year of production. And standard bred birds tend to be leaner and uh, carry at maintain production over a longer term. There's your feed store above Warbington, kind of narrow, um, and a big beautiful standard bread above Warbington. Feed store barred rock, and there's a, a quality standard bread barred rock. So. so can you explain now what's the difference between standard bread and feed store? Um, so feed stores and hatcheries, they, they breed birds to sell birds. Um, all they care about is you know, making mass income production. from that, right? So they're not really focused on egg production qualities, uh, longevity, you know, weight management or maintenance or anything like that. Depending on what your goals are for your birds, um, you know, if you're working with a purebred or standard bred bird, that can help you achieve those goals better. If you're looking at, at egg production, you know, standard bred, leg corn or something like that is, is going to be able to provide you more consistent product there. Um, for meat birds, you know, many of these breeds um, can fulfill both eggs and meat, but um, some things like the stamp red cornish and that, uh, not only are they more attractive than our broilers, they're healthier and uh, they can still put on weight just as well. So for somebody that's completely new at this, Rather than go to the feed store, where do you go from the stem? Yeah, so I would recommend looking into one of those organizations there. Okay. And I'll leave my card on the table here, and you guys are welcome to touch base with me uh, later to find out more. Do breeders sell and breeders have like maybe a dozen backyard chickens? Do they work like smaller numbers? Absolutely. Or? Yeah. Um, we're we're all over your community. We have three thousand members nationally in the APA, and there's a bunch of people that aren't members that raise standard bred birds. Um, a good way to, to meet those people or, or just see the variety and the choice that you could have in your backyard is to go to an open poultry show. Um, and our next one in the region is in Monroe, March 17th at the fairgrounds there. Um, but we have the, the fair here in Linden. That's a good opportunity to meet people and, and see a big variety. So that's it for me. Is there um, any other questions that, that people would like to ask? Or? You talked about sawdust. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen chickens eat sawdust. So does that hurt them? It, it really doesn't. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons that they might do that is, is thinking about their environment. So, you know, are they bored or are they being... Um, 
pecked on a whole bunch, you know, maybe that's a displacement behavior. Um, maybe you are overcrowded. So thinking about those things, but um, they're inquisitive and, and they'll learn pretty quickly that they don't want to keep eating that. Chickens are really, um, they're really attracted to color and texture. So that's why they really like uh, whole corn kernels and those kind of things. It's smooth, it's bright. Um, they really don't have a good sense of taste or anything like that, but sawdust, you know, the sharp edges and uh, kind of flat color, I think, will turn them off fairly quickly. So. You sure like you? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what about a dirt bath? I have a uh, chicken tractor move it around, but the, the hens really like to bear the ground as soon as possible and dig in and give themselves better dirt baths. Uh, it, 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 should I be bringing in sand for that so they can engage in that activity? Or yeah, yeah um, you can. Uh, I like sand because you know you can bring it in and it can be fairly clean there, um, drain really well and, and pretty porous. Um, but certainly you can you can work with a dust bath as well. Just be thinking about um, creating mud and you want to avoid that, so covering it up as fast as you can to be getting some grass seed in on top of it and you move your tractor again. So why do you want to avoid mud? Um, you know, mud is a, is a way that we can transmit diseases and pathogens more. It's how we uh, leach nutrients into the groundwater. Um, so putting sand over it is a way to handle it? Yeah, if you're in your confinement area, but if you're, you know, if you have a little bit of mud and you're moving your birds off of that, maybe just getting some cover or some seed or uh, organic matter on top of that to help hold it in place. We, you know, part of what conservation districts do too is really look at your soil health, and when you have a lot of mud in there, you don't have a lot of soil structure and health there. So. Use a heat lamp or not? Seems to be a lot of in, in for in the winter in or um, I don't. I raise all my birds outside. I do have a heat lamp on them when they're young, but they're still outside um, from basically day four or five, and I feel that really makes them a lot more hardy. Um, if you do have breeds with big combs or something like that, you may consider that just to minimize the chance of frostbite. If you have really small breeds, um, maybe you'd want to do that because they can't thermoregulate as well, but if you have a nice insulated coop, they're fine. Chickens put out a lot of BTUs of energy, so having good ventilation in your coop is actually really, really important. What about them slowing down laying eggs when it gets cold? Yeah, so um, birds like about 14 hours of daylight to do their maximum production, so if that's a goal of yours, putting a light on a timer would be really important. They do seasonally like to go into a mold between you know, July and November depending on the strain of bird and the age. Um, and as long as they're molting out and growing in their main primary wing feathers or their tail feathers, they're not going to be laying. So um, you may play with your lights around that time as well. So a, um, I've heard different um, years. And some people say that chickens kind of stop laying after like three, three years old, four years old. Um, what do you recommend doing with chickens after they stop playing, or is that not? Your, your first two years of production are going to be the best. Um, after that second year, they tend to pack on more fat in their abdominal cavity, um, and they're just a little bit older, more mature, so their egg production will start to decline. Um, you, you know, I've had eight, ten-year-old birds that you might get an egg a week, maybe, but that's where you have to figure out, you know, what's your cutoff point and what is it worth for you. So, for me, in terms of egg production and breeding, I like to cycle through the birds after the end of their second season. Um, but so, do you do you eat them then? I do. I eat them and um, sell a lot of birds as well. So. so, when you introduce new birds into the flock, how do you keep them from biting? Yeah, I like to, if I can, bring in a smaller cage and set them in there, you know, for a day or two so they can see each other, um, but maybe not interact. Um, if you only have one pen set up, putting them in at night can help. Um, they can sort of acclimate there, and then as they wake up, they'll slowly meet each other. So, um, 
chickens do have a pecking order, right? So there's there's maybe going to be a few days of roughness, and eventually they'll get over it. What age do you introduce the new birds? The young birds? I keep birds um, four months and under separate from adult birds. Four that's, months and under. Yeah, that's really for for a um, feed and nutrition standpoint. Um, and maybe Scratch and Peck will talk about this. But your younger birds, um, you want a higher protein feed for growth, and then as they mature, they can come down to more of a maintenance level. For laying production is about 16% protein. Young birds, 18-19% um, is the best. I, I feed a 19% pellet, but I do that because it's uh, from my local mill and I can order it in 1,100 pound sacks. So. <laughs> right, that's expensive. Yeah. That's another question. Pellet or the crumbles, it seems like they waste the pellet more than they feed the pellet. Yeah, um, I, I personally feed a pellet for, for waste um, because it does waste less than the crumbles, but it's going to depend on the age of your bird, the size of your bird. You know, a younger or smaller bird, you want a smaller granule for them to eat. Um, and then Scratch and Peck does a lot of grains and stuff, and that's also a really nice product. So um, again, it's just going to depend on your kind of your goals and um, what your setup is like. I'll ask you too, but you'll be the third person I've asked. In an egg, I found a whole seed more than once. Inside the egg. A complete whole seed. And I was feeding scratch with quite a bit of seed. And they have access where they're at, there's quite a bit of gravel. So I'm, I'm thinking they can pick up enough for the frog. Yeah, I, I would think those reproductive systems would be separate from that, but <laughs> maybe it's a calcium deposit or something in there. You mean with the particles in there? It was a seed. Okay. And it wasn't just once, it was several times. It was, I didn't take a picture of the actual seed, but later on there was one that had a whole bunch of seeds in the book. Mm. I knew a picture of it. You might want to take that chicken on the road, and then you can make some. <laughs> 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 oh, uh, can we say uh, more about uh, density, like optimal density? For I mean, I think it's just after market, but I don't like to think of my chickens as overly crowded. And, right. But what's the best sort of density for chickens? Yeah, so chickens are flock animals, so I'd say. You know, two is probably your minimum, but um, uh, you know, you know, it's going to depend on what your setup is like. I don't ever do um, less than three square feet per bird in the coop setting, and then you can give them a little more room uh, with your yard and your run. Maybe about ten square feet in your confinement area or your wintering area, and then hundred square feet or more in, in their run or free range. That's it's nice to have uh, kind of a potpourri of different things out there in the yard, different things to look at. Um, I like to work with less breeds and varieties myself. Um, I I do three main breeds right now, and that's just so that I can sort of work on my standardization of improving the birds, improving their production qualities uh, and their attractiveness. Um, and then it just sort of allows you to set your template there with your expectation for how much they're going to feed um, and then the cycle throughout the year. So different breeds and strains have different times that they come into molt, um, different levels of production and things. So it just gives you a little more consistency the less things you have. But. When you when you breed birds, uh, is there any danger in using the offspring roosters to breed with the, you know, the parent bird? Or should you kind of try to separate that? Um, we often line breed when we're, we're breeding birds, which is um, breeding related birds together. Because um, they try and stay away from brother to sister. Um, but, you know, using a mother to son or daughter to father for a few generations is that you're not really going to see much of a problem there. Yes. 
it's a good way if there's a trait that you like in both of those birds to quickly distill that. Mm -hmm. Is your presentation available via a link on the Whatcom Conservation District site or anything? Yeah, we record all of the presentations, which should be recorded right now, and so we post that with this talk going through it. So it usually takes us a couple of days. So don't look right. <laughs> well, Any thank you. For Emmett, he'll be available at the end of the time period as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. believe that chickens are humanity's common denominator. They bring us all together. We've been dealing with chickens for millennia and basically almost every culture on the planet somehow has something to do with chickens in their lives. And um, So I try to focus on that and I think it's a wonderful way to be more sustainable. I see so many people wanting to be more sustainable um, in the last few years that I've been teaching, chickens have really like blown up. They're like all the range right now. And I hope that continues to grow. And um, I also teach a more involved class. Uh, it's a beginner chicken keeping class for those of you that have not started on your chicken journey yet. You're just thinking about getting some baby chicks. Super exciting. Um, so if that's where you're at, my class at Whatcom Community College is a is a great uh, thing to um, come and participate in. I love to see chicken people everywhere I go. So today I'm going to talk about scratch and peck feeds, which I love. Um, I am an ambassador for scratch and peck feeds because I really believe in the product. Um, I've been doing this chicken thing for a while, but when Scratch and Peck approached me and they said, hey, do you want to be an ambassador for us? I just jumped on it because I've been watching this company grow uh, for the last several years and they've really kind of changed the way we think, or really the way the industry is, start, is thinking about chicken feed. And I've, I've really seen a shift towards um, more natural, more <coughs> organic, non-GMO, um, I believe that Scratch and Peck Feeds is the first non-GMO chicken feed on the market. And what we say is, you are what your animals eat, which is like true, right? <laughs> so, a great way to start out with your chicken adventure is a really good feed um, like Scratch and Peck Feeds. Uh, they have a starter, which I thought I brought out here, but I didn't. Um, and uh, that is what I fed my first flock of baby chicks and they thrived on it. And the awesome thing about this starter and all of Scratch and Peck feeds is that you can, does anyone know? <laughs> what can you do with this feed? Yes, you can ferment it. You can ferment this feed. And that is something that I mean, it seems like everywhere you look, somebody's talking about how you need fermented foods in your diet because uh, we have learned that there's a reason why there's been, we've been, humans have been fermenting food uh, for a really long time. A lot of indigenous foods are fermented. And it's because we need to keep our guts healthy. And chickens also need healthy guts. If you think about it, like chickens are pooping a lot, right? <laughs> That's like half their life. And it, it's the half your life is gonna be cleaning it up because uh, <laughs> they poop so much. But uh, they'll poop less if you feed them ferment, fermented food because they're absorbing more nutrients. Um, so when people ask me, okay, what are the most important things that I need to focus on with my chicken's health? I say reproductive health, and digestive health. So, um, as I'm gonna be doing a little demonstration here, uh, I'm gonna be fermenting some feed right before your eyes, before a live studio audience. This is the first time I'm doing this. You can say that because there's a camera right there. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be 
showing you how to sprout your feed, which is another way to get more nutrients into your chicken's diet. So, reproductive health. Chickens lay eggs. They need calcium in order to lay good, strong eggs, so you're gonna wanna provide um, a good layer feed, which is gonna have some calcium in it, and then also oyster shell. Or you can, there's some other things that you can do, but right now I'm gonna talk about oyster shell because it's something that Scratch and Peck offers and it's super easy and I'm into doing the easy thing. Not too much work and more time enjoying my chickens. So I freed, feed oyster shell in a separate dish from, my, um, from their food feed um, and they just know to eat it, the, the females know to eat it and um, they'll, this will ensure that, or will help in making sure that the productive system is working well. They should, your hens are gonna have nice strong eggs because you don't want them to have weak shelled eggs. That's when you run into lots of problems. Um, another thing that you can do from the beginning is provide uh, herbs for your chickens. Uh, these are the Cluckin' Good Herbs that Scratch and Peck puts out, um, and you could also dry your own herbs. There's always that option too. Um, and this has all the herbs that really people are talking about right now uh, as being antimicrobial, um, antibacterial, just to keep your digestive system healthy. And also, it smells amazing. If you guys get a chance, please get a sample of these herbs and open it up and smell it. It makes your coop smell so good. Um, it also could help in keeping critters, mites away, because uh, they don't, they don't, it repels them. Um, and it makes your eggs taste better. And when you open it, it's like, it smells like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> it's amazing. And I love putting this in my coop. I put a little bit in the nesting boxes. Um, I put it on the floor of my coop. I mix it in with their feed um, and they like it. And I, I have seen them um, get really nice and hearty and beautiful on this stuff. So I believe in that. Um, when your chickens are molting um, or during the winter months, you might want to supplement with a little more protein. And one great way to do that is with uh, mealworms. We see mealworms at the farm store. Um, there's a joke, all the farm stores call it chicken crack because <laughs> chickens just go crazy on it. Um, these are Cluck and Good Herbs, which uh, Scratch and Peck provides. Uh, what I really like about this is that it is locally, these are locally raised. Um, they are soldier fly, black soldier fly larvae. Um, and I think the company, the, the, the place is like in Ferndale? It's 50 miles from here. It's in Abbotsford. Okay, Abbotsford. Pre-consumer food waste. Yeah, and if you look, most of the mealworms that you can buy are actually from China, which is is strange. You know, when my husband saw that, he was like, "Can we not make worms here? <laughs> Why do we need to get them from China?" Um, so that that I think is I think it's a good step to try and uh, get something locally. Um, because that, it's just not necessary for us to be using that many resources just to get um, worms, treats for our chickens over here. Um, so, but I know all of you are here because you want to learn about fermenting and sprouting feed. So I'm going to show you how easy it is. And I was, up until recently, pretty intimidated by it. Um, but it's actually so easy. And right now, Scratch and Peck has these little fermenting and sprouting kits and it has everything in it now if you have a big flock you're obviously going to need something bigger than this but it's a great way um, even if your flock is bigger you can start out uh, fermenting in this kit and get the hang of it and then you can move on to like a bigger bucket um, and it's just so darn easy so they send you if you go if you buy this or you go online and get it they send you this little jar and we know that when we're fermenting things it has to breathe. We don't want to close it up. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't ever want to use a container that has a, a lid that is going to completely close or it's not going to work. It needs to breathe. 
So, inside, oh gosh, this ring is not Inside here, they give you some uh, whole grains, and this is barley, if you want to sprout. And then also you have a little bit of feed. Now, you're gonna want to uh, start out fermenting what your chickens are going to eat in a day. So if you have a large flock and you want to start out small, that's okay. You can just ferment a little bit to get the hang of it. Um, oh, I kind of want to, I'm going to use this jar so you guys can see. So chickens generally eat about a, a, a standard size chicken, about a half a cup to like a two, two thirds a cup, give or take, of feed per day, depending on what you're feeding. Um, so you want to put as much in here as they're going to eat in a day. Um, and you could actually put a little bit less because it's going to expand. So basically I usually would do about one part feed and then two parts water. And you don't want to use chlorinated water. You want to use distilled water. Um, and if you don't have that, because uh, you don't want it to have chlor uh, chlorine in it. If you don't have this, you can just set regular water out for 24 hours and that chlorine will, will evaporate out of it. So I'm going to fill this up and, you know, you'll kind of get the hang of it. Like I sometimes will use a little bit less water um, and it, it just is a different consistency. But even if you put too much water, you can always strain it out at the you know when you're ready to use it um, and so you see I just it's just as easy as pie I just filled it up and now it's the ratio is about uh, one cup feed and two cups water two parts and then I'm gonna cover it up oh I'm gonna mix it and I forgot my little wooden spoon it's over there but that's okay so we'll pretend that I have a spoon <laughs> I'm gonna mix it up, make sure it's all. Put the lid on and shake it. Screen. Well, it's got a screen. On it. <laughs> but you could. I mean, I could put I could put this lid on it and shake it, and then take it off. So and then it's going like it's already it's already, it's already I think I can hear it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it is starting the fermenting process. Um, Probably after about 24 hours, you're going to see a little bit of bubbling and you might smell a little, it might smell a little bit fermented, but it's best, depending on the temperature, uh, you want to keep it at room temperature and depending on the temperature of your home, um, it's, it might be done a little bit sooner or it will probably take about three days uh, for it to be, have the optimal amount of nutrition in it. Um, and you will know because it has kind of a sour smell, kind of, it's not a bad smell, it's not a rancid smell. You will know if it, if it, if it's not right, you'll know. Um, it's kind of like a soury, like a sweet yogurt kind of smell. Um, and you want to stir it every day. And then when you're ready to feed it to your chicks after the third day, oh, and I was going to show you this little kit. It comes with these little tags that you can put on it day one. <laughs> so if you're like me, I'm like, you know, when did I start this? I don't know. So, but they help you with their little tags. So day three, um, it's ready to be fed to your chickens and you can just drain the water out. You can use a little bit of that water for your next batch um, and feed it to your chickens. And they should eat a little bit less of it. Um, it's a great way to save some money. Um, we all know that you know we, we want to feed organic. We want to feed the best things um, to our families and to our animals. But unfortunately, right now we're at a time where it's expensive to do that. So if you can ferment your feed, that's a, a way to um, take some of that expense off of your shoulders. And uh, basically, what it does is it, it will boost the protein content in your feed. Um, it create, we know that it creates friendly bacteria for the chicken's digestive system. 
Um, it increases vitamins in your feed. Uh, it makes their feed more digestible. Uh, you could have less poop, less chicken poop, which is always good. We want less to clean up and deal with. And it might actually smell a little bit better too. You have that added bonus, and especially if you're using the herbs. Um, and uh, in the summer months, I really like it because it uh, is another way that you can hydrate your chickens. So they're getting more moisture in their food. So that's always a good thing. Um, and then you're going to be feeding them less because they're getting more out of their feed. The feed is also expanding, so you'll have more, more of it. Um, so I think it's a really great thing to do. Uh, I know that there's some people that are like, well, you know, I can't just ferment. I have, you know, 50 chickens. I, I really don't feel like I can ferment for all of them. Well, you can do a little bit and you can supplement it, supplement them with that. Um, you can do it during their molting time um, or during the winter when it's, you know, colder and you want them to have a little more protein for the colder nights. So there's just so many things that you can do to boost the nutrition that, and it's, it's just so simple as, I mean, there's really nothing more to it than that. And when, if you have a larger flock, which, you know, I don't know, I, I think, okay, this is enough maybe for a couple chickens, but we all know about chicken math and, and no one has a couple chickens for long. So <laughs> you can use a larger jar uh, you can use a, a five gallon bucket and just make sure that the lid is not on it. You know, it's not closed. So maybe like a bucket with a bit of a broken lid so that it can breathe. So that is it. And here, um, when did we start fermenting this? Okay, this is 24 hours and you'll see it's starting to get a little bit. And this is actually closed just because we've been traveling with it. So didn't want it all over the <laughs> all over the trunk of the car but um yeah it's already if you I'm gonna open it and it already I can smell it it already kind of starting to have that that smell and it's it's a nice fresh smell if it does smell moldy or bad or like alcohol um, don't drink it <laughs> Throw it out. Oh, fermentation, not alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> yes. how, how, how often do you would you provide the birds fermented food? Well, it just depends on what you want to do. I mean, optimally, it would be every day. Uh -huh. So you would start, you know, depending on the size of your flock, you start a new process every day, is and you so you will have a little system. <coughs> yes. Is this the only thing you give your birds? Uh, it is not, right? Uh, you know, it just depends on the time of the year. Um, right now I'm not doing it because we've been out of town for a month and we came back and I just, my uh, house sitter is not a chicken person, so I didn't want to, you know, oh, you have to ferment for my, you know, 18 chickens or whatever. Um, so, but, and a lot of what I will do um, is I'll ferment a little bit and I make a mash, I make like a gruel every morning out of the scratch and peck. So I'll make the gruel and then I'll put a little bit of fermented feed in that. So they're getting, you know, they're eating all the fines. That's another thing. Scratch and peck has um, what we call the fines and that's um, kind of like the sandy uh, material that you'll find in, a scr in the scratch and peck feed. And a lot of times chickens will you know how chickens are. They'll eat <laughs> what they like and then they'll walk away and there's all the fines there that they didn't eat. Well, that costs money. You better get your fuzzy butt back here and start eating that. But they don't want to eat it because they're just like, oh, well, it doesn't, you know, it's just like sand. So if you make a gruel out of their chicken feed or if you ferment it, you're using all of that. So that's less waste in, in that way as well. And also, those fines is where a lot of the nutrition in this feed is. Um, that's where the protein is. So you really want them to eat that. Um, and some flocks do eat it, but my flock does not. And <laughs> there's a lot of flocks that won't eat it. So, um, you know, if it's not made into a, a bit of a, like an oatmeal consistency for them. So, like I said, there's 
many different levels that you can uh, that you can experiment with. Um, I know that there's large farms out there that are fermenting their feet every day and Scratch and Pack works with them and it's amazing. Um, I have a small group of rescue chickens. I was laughing during Emmett's um, presentation because I thought, oh God, I hope he doesn't come to judge any of my chickens because <laughs> they're all like, it's like the island of misfit chickens in my house. <laughs> So not not exactly show chickens, but that's just my style. How do you divide it when, when you ferment it? Is it in a trough? Yeah, you, yes. Um, or I just have, you know, because of my the size of my um, flock, I just use like a, a bowl, a metal bowl. And I'll also take some out and put some on the ground so that the small, I have um, lots of little tiny chickens. And so just to make sure everybody gets it. And I feed them in the morning. Um, I feed them enough uh, to where by the afternoon it's gone. Um, I don't want feed out overnight because we all know that what comes out at night, little beady eyes and <laughs> fuzzy, fuzzy bodies, little rats. So we don't want that. So um, I make sure that they consume everything by early afternoon and they're fine and then they have the rest of the afternoon to um, graze and free range I am gonna I'm gonna try and pull this out because I want to show you how to sprout which is another way that you can keep your birds healthy so Sprouting grains. Another thing that is super popular right now, um, Scratch and Peck has organic, they sell, sorry, there's a microphone. Oh, Just, I'm sorry. You keep covering it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's because I talk so loud. I don't really need it, you know? I know everyone can hear me. Um, so Scratch and Peck has whole grains that, um, that they sell. This is organic barley. Um, they have sprouted wheat, they have uh, peas, um, and I think that's it. Oh, oats, oats. Um, and it's, it's almost the same, a little, a little bit different, but there's a lot of similarities um, with sprouting grains and fermenting. Mainly in that it's just super duper easy to do. So what you're gonna wanna do is fill your jar. I'm gonna fill this about one, Let's see, it's probably going to be about a half, halfway full. And this, it doesn't really matter as much. Okay, I'm not going to put it in front of the mic. <laughs> uh, so I've just got about the, this small amount of grains in here. And uh, same thing, I like to use distilled water um, just because, just to keep that chlorine out of it. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you're covering, this is the most important part, that you're covering the grains with water. So you don't want any of them to be sticking out because then you might have some problems with mold, which is what you really want to watch for. So when you are sprouting grains, you are going to want to uh, cover the grains with water and you want to um, leave a little bit of room at the top. But instead of putting that screen on top or a cheesecloth on top or a broken lid, for the first 24 hours, we're putting the lid on the jar. And we're gonna keep it closed like that at room temperature. And during this time, the magic is gonna start happening. The seed is gonna start breaking down a little bit and uh, it's going to begin the process of sprouting. So after 24 hours, what you will want to do is dump out this water. And you can keep this in your kitchen, like maybe you have, or wherever, wherever you have some sun in your house, um, so that, you know, because you're growing plants, so they will do better if they have a little bit of sun. So you will want to dump out 
your water and then uh, for that time for the next you know until the next time that you rinse it which will be the following day you're going to start rinsing it twice a day um, you will want to keep it upside down just to make sure it's not going to have a lot of um, you don't want it to have too much moisture because that's when you might get some mold or mildew um, and then so for the next few days you're going to rinse it twice a day uh, and then you you can put it on its side you just want to keep the seeds dry as, as much they're going to be a little bit wet but you don't want them like sitting in water um, you can lay it on its side in the in the window and then the next time you rinse it turn it over or lay it on the other side and uh, after about 24 to 48 hours you're going to see the little sprouts start to come out and you just keep doing it until um, you have about the scratch and peck says that the optimal uh, size of the sprout would be about two inches and then it's ready to feed to your chickens and and I would suggest feeding it at that point um, and then refrigerating it um, if you go to where it starts to starts to grow grass you just will run more of a chance to get mold and uh, again this is for a small flock I actually had sprouted a jar this size and it was a great afternoon treat for my chickens um, I have how many chickens do I have let's see uh, I think 13 yeah 13 that's real math not chicken math <laughs> I have some in there that they only count about one-fourth chicken I think. Um, so yeah it was a great treat for them they just gobbled it right up and again more protein um, you are giving getting them more vitamins this is great if you don't have a flock that free ranges um, you're getting a lot of that nutrients into them that they would get uh, from past from the pasture you're getting a lot of that in there um, and then during times when they're if you can't do it all year uh, during times when they're molting or um, they just need a little bit of extra nutrition so that is uh, another way to get more nutrition into your chickens super easy uh, obviously if you have a larger flock you probably will use like trays um, and that's very easy it's basically the, just about the same process but in a tray um, and and that's basically it it's it's easy it's fun uh, it doesn't take up a lot of time and that is what I'm all about not taking up too much time because I like to spend lots of time just being among my chickens and watching them. Um, I think I can take some questions now if anybody has. Questions. You know that sprouted wheat isn't just for chickens. My dad used to have Ferndale Bakery and one of our big sellers was sprouted wheat bread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean I bet it was delicious too. Uh, everybody loved it. Yeah, actually my kids eat sprouted tofu. <laughs> so uh, it's just uh, very nutritious. Another way to make it more nutritious, more digestible. I know that there's people that can't tolerate regular bread, but they can eat sprouted bread, no exactly. problem. Yeah. Because of the extra uh, nutrition in it and uh, digestive enzymes and all that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, please join my page or like my page. It's Welcome to Chickenlandia. Uh, I also will have my website is launching in the next few weeks. It's welcome to chickenlandia.com and you can watch my TED talk, my TEDx talk uh, that I did um, at Western Washington University last year. It's called I Dream of Chickens okay. and I really do. <laughs> I really, really do. Uh, it's been so great talking to you guys. Thank you very much for giving me your time and good luck with your chicken adventure.